Uh, Annie Devonport from the Disasters Emergency Committee. Obviously, our, our thoughts are very much at the moment uh, in the Philippines. Um, you know, when, when I read this, uh, the draft of this book, um, which was just about a month ago, uh, or six weeks ago, we, we hadn't had a sudden onset disaster for some time. And I was thinking, would, you know, how applicable will this be for the DC 14 member agencies um, to, to review such a, a disaster? And now here we are, um, massive, massive uh, um, typhoon damage across a you know, complex area. Um, with lots of little islands, and, and our agencies will be working in lots of different places. Would this be a useful tool for us to to um, to look at the contribution of our members, and what will it tell us? What, wh what will we learn from it? Annie, thank you. Anybody else, please? Em uh, hello, Emily. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Okay. Um, so I thank you, you very much. Say who you are. Oh, I'm mm. Emily Rogers, mm. um, currently with the British Red Cross um, in the performance and accountability team. Um, thank you very much. That was really interesting, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, I haven't s looked at the content, so I'm not sure c the questions, but it would be really interesting to know in the process of simplifying, what were some of the difficult decisions you had to make about what to exclude? Um, yeah. Anyone else? Please. Oh, hello. It's <laughs> 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 Hi, Theresa Hanley. <laughs> Um, I'd be really, well actually there are two points. One is um, on a, a promotion for ELRA. There's actually a guide about um, which supports partnerships between academic and operational organisations which features um, the UEA Oxfam one, which, which I know because I co-wrote it with uh, Isabel and we interviewed Danny for it as well, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. So if anyone is interested in doing that type of partnership, then um, that, that guide might be helpful. But my, my question is on this... Um, the methodology for assessing the extent of the contribution, uh, I'd be interested if you could say a little bit more about how you've sort of gone about that. I mean, th those of us using contribution analysis, I think, are sort of struggling with that whole process. So, yeah. Any, any more sort of learnings, reflections, tips would be useful. Mm. One more? John, please. Thank you. Uh, yes, John Borton, uh, independent. Well, I guess I'm also linked to ODI. Um, two questions, really. One is, could you expand a bit more on why you chose not, why you chose to go with contribution rather than look harder at attribution? I'd just be interested to hear that. And also, um, how did DFID feel about this? Methodology is this something that they they value? Uh, does this fit in with with their concern with value for money? Um, I understand Joanna McRae was going to be here, but but she's not. I would have asked her, but uh, <laughs> I'd just be interested to hear how they've received it. Thank you. Well, with that question in mind, is there anybody from Diffid in here today? Anyone from Diffid turned up? We might have to second guess that one, John, by the sound, mm. by the feel of it. Good. Um, so we have a question from uh, about whether we can use this tool in the Philippines to assess recovery. Uh, there's one question about simplifying decisions. Um, uh, <coughs> more tips and methods um, would be helpful. And John's asking why contribution rather than attribution, why you didn't go for the tough one. So who would like to start? Danny, yes. I haven't said anything, so I'll Over to you, Danny. start, and that way I can pick which questions not to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think just in the first question um, from Annie, uh, I think it's one of the reflections that we had throughout this process, I think, was that we faced a, an unusual challenge um, over the last 10 years, which was that we found it quite hard to find... Um, stereotypical kind of case studies um, of rapid onset emergencies 
which we thought would be appropriate for, for our pilots. Um, it has surprisingly the last perhaps two years have been, as you mentioned, relatively quiet in terms of rapid onset emergencies. Um, it was some time after, it was perhaps t too long after the Pakistan uh, earthquake um, for us to feel comfortable with um, being able to trial a, a, like a retrospective baseline approach to um, establishing a, a, a you know, baseline. Um, so I, I think I can speak f for all of us in that um, we would hope that a, a situation like the Philippines um, typhoon would be an ideal um, context in which uh, we would hope that this would be a useful tool. Um, and having said that, I'd ex expect that a lot more learning would come from um, from that from that process. Um, okay, um, so you've done three three case studies: Bihar, yep. uh, Guatemala, Sri Lanka. What level of confidence do you feel that you have as as a team that this is actually going to be of use to DEC member agencies? Um, I, I'd say quite you know, high level. I think I think it's going to be you know, quite useful. Um, I mean, the challenge that I faced mm. when I went to Bihar was that um, it was an emergency in which um, the, the international involvement was mm. uh, quite limited. Mm. Um, there weren't you know, NGOs falling over each other to uh, respond, um, and, and the primary kind of um, contribution to recovery was very clearly in that context. Mm. You know, local recovery efforts. Um, some state involvement. Um, yeah. And are you looking for, for feedback? Is this a, it, this is it's not a pilot version, is it? It's uh, no. No, this is it. This is it. Okay. Yeah. 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 But maybe there'll be a second edition. If you uh, uh, is there a feedback process for for this? Or um, well, not an official one, but I mean, obviously, we would welcome. I mean, we don't want people writing and going like, "I think you have to rewrite it," because <laughs> you know, having. Mm -hmm. I think we need to give Roger a bit of a rest from he, as he did most of the a lot of the, the editing and work on it. Um, but no, I mean, obviously, we would welcome uh, feedback uh, on it, especially people who've used it. Um, and I would say with the Philippines, I think it'd be fantastic because, um, I guess, the thing that I always find. Uh, a bit frustrating, um, and that kind of also answers a bit of your question about contribution attribution, is that in a lot of these evaluations that are done, it's always the NGOs or the UN, whoever it is, it's their efforts, and, and nobody ever seems to take into account that the beneficiaries or the people who are affected by uh, the disaster are actually do quite a lot for themselves, and that somehow gets lost in it. And I think we feel with our with our methodology that that actually acknowledges that that quite a lot happens that that, that we're not part of um, and and to me if, especially if we talk so much about accountability I think that's really really important um, and that's why I like it to be contribution because I think if we're trying to attribute it to us uh, we're fooling ourselves um, and I guess also for the Philippines, I think it'd be interesting because what we did find a little bit in, in Sri Lanka, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was that actually there hadn't been, a, the recovery had only been partial. I mean, they really, the NGOs had done a lot of work for about six months and then actually not, not a lot had happened after that and people were left with half empty, half built houses and things. So I think for the Philippines, it's really good to see how, how much they had recovered after you know, the effort that's gone into it. Can I just <coughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I think it definitely has potential, but it very much, uh, it will vary, for, I think, from location lo to location, depending on the degree of devastation. Um, if, I mean, in some of the, I've not been there, but I've seen some of the images, and clearly there's, there's an enormous reconstruction work, and, I, and I'm not sure how long people will be displaced for. So if you're in a situation where people are displaced for a very long time, it would be difficult to adapt this methodology to that. I think in situations where there's been um, severe damage, but the intention is to get people back quite quickly to where they're back farming their land and so on, that's the sort of situation that's, that it's ideal for. Because that's... that's we, can, we can look at change in the same place and how people have, and how people have adjusted their lives and how 
others have helped them to readjust their lives. So, so I would say yes, very much so, and it'll be a case of enabling us down the line to 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 make some kind of estimates of the extent to which the interventions that have taken place have have met people's needs. So, I think yes. Um, the, 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 what would be interesting is a question is is what point to start programming that? Um, clearly not now, but but. Um, I think it's something that should be thought about, and because there's so many agencies working together, actually, it could be could be a strong opportunity to do it. Even it, um, you know, even if it, even if it's if it's not done, at, obviously the scale of, of the disaster is huge, so you can't necessarily, you may or may not want to do it across the whole the whole thing. But to look, it could look at you know particular particular case examples or, or as it were cluster samples within that. Um, it would give an illustrative picture of how effectively it's it's. The process is taking place. Okay, Marcella, for you. Um, I think I mean we've covered most of the questions, probably except from the what needs to be excluded or, or mm. simplified. And and I think mm. that the main feedback I, we got for that one was about the tools. I mean we started with um, trying to use tools that um, it was also closely linked to the attribution thing. I mean we're trying to use very technical tools to, to just kind of like really look at whether it was possible to measure impact and to just do something more technical. And the first thing was an approach to try to do that and to see how how realistic it was, uh, knowing that we were like in a place in which I mean people recovering from a disaster is I mean there's ethical concerns that are raised when you're gonna go and interview these people. Uh, if you need to establish a comparison group, how do you do it and so on. So I think that the what would we, what peop the feedback we got from enumerators in the sense of, of simplifying was simplifying the tools. It's like okay, I mean I can go and ask, I can I can do and do a survey or have a chat with someone, but I cannot expect these people to talk to me for an hour. I mean, these are people living under very um, demanding circumstances and conditions and, and, and they kept talking about uh, along those lines. So I think that, that the simplifying was mainly about the tool. And I think, I mean, I think my colleagues have covered most of the other questions. There was one other aspect mm. to John's mm. question, um, and obviously, un unfortunately, if it are not here or that mm. have funded this research, which we are grateful. Mm. Um, and so I you know, can't speak for uh, mm. different mm. in terms of how they're going to respond to this guide, but um, I hope that it will be favourable because um, the overall context, obviously, of this this guide is that it is you know it's part of this much wider um, evidence agenda and, and drive for you know mm. trying to find um, evidence. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um, is a is this probably a separate discussion. Um, but what we really hope that this uh, I mean a large part of that agenda I think puts NGOs on the back foot um, and other humanitarian agencies on the back foot because. Humanitarian emergencies, I think most people appreciate, are not usually the, the ideal situation for an experimental design to, you know, like a rigorous impact mm. assessment trial or, or something like that. Um, what we have attempted to do is to provide a, a structured way for uh, humanitarian actors to um, collect and interpret their evidence um, to um, make some sort of credible um, statements about you know, their contribution to uh, recovery in, in, a, in a complex context. Mm. Um, but it's obviously only one approach to doing that. It's not as if this is, you know, mm. this is definitely not the end of the story. Mm. John, can I just, mm. just add uh, in relation to what you were saying about the methodology? Mm. I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about is that really is, is that the, the way that we con conceive of the analysis is it's rooted in the idea of triangulation. So, we're not suggesting there's an indicator of contribution, a measurable, definable indicator that you can readily come up with. It's a matter of bringing evidence together, being honest and open about that, and how you assemble that evidence, and different types of evidence. So in terms of ext measuring the extent of contribution, we, we present ways to look at change in people's livelihoods during that course of time. We present ways to look at the pattern of receipt and the types of intervention that they've have taken place, and then a lot of the w a lot of the uh, information input around why change occurred, why people feel the change has occurred since you know during the course of intervention in their lives, has to come out through through more qualitative work. So, 
it's a combination of those three. And this this is where I say you know some degree of of analytical skill uh, has to come in and be prepared to interpret from data, but interpret on the basis of of a robust set yeah. of evidence. Any more questions, points, ideas? Please. <coughs> Hi, Jenny Richmond from Oxfam. I just thought it'd be useful to hear a little bit more about what now. Um, so how are these ideas and, and the, the methodology going to be shared with the DFIDs, the UNs, the, the NGOs? Um, how is that actually going to be applied in practice? Jenny, thank you. Person just at the back there. Um, I'm Katrina Dijon from Tearfund, Impact and Evaluation Advisor. Um, I just want, uh, it's really, really interesting to, to hear the presentation and the, about the tool. Um, and um, at Tier Fund, we're also developing something fairly similar around um, for development. Um, and we've started to look at behavioural theory as well and how that, that influences change. And I just wondered if that had come across in your, in your work and um, if that's been included. Thank you. Anyone else? P Peter, nice to see you too, because of all these old faces. <laughs> Peter Giesen. Um, I just wanted to respond to uh, Daniel's point that uh, humanitarian situations might not be the best places to uh, do um, uh, evalua impact evaluations based on um, sort of methodologies we were talking about, the impact evaluations needing counterfactuals. Um, there are actually some initiatives uh, underway uh, with 3IE and DFID. Um, uh, OCHA, we've had workshops in Kinshasa with the pool fund uh, that suggested that 15 of those projects in Eastern DRC are actually impact evaluable using the 3IE uh, impact methodologies adapted to humanitarian context. So even in data scare situations, it's possible to do um, that type of impact evaluations. But I don't know if it's relevant to to your methodology, but it's a different methodology. Mm -hmm. And what you said uh, also is that you know it's there, there are actually complement. This is you know a complementary method mm -hmm. to to other methods. So I think that fits very well. Okay, thank you. So we have a, a question about what happens now uh, with with the guide. Um, Katrina from Tearfound has been looking at behavioural theory for um, a, a similar kind of guide for development. So I don't know whether you had a look at that or not. We'll, we'll hear in a minute. And Peter suggesting that there are uh, si uh, situations that are impact evaluable. That sounds like a phrase that comes from an evaluator's mouth, doesn't it? Um, and it would be interesting to know whether how... You see the guide as being complementary to that or different different to, to, to that kind of... You, you're talking about literally looking at attribution there, aren't you? Attribution. Yeah, th with three IE. Yeah, OK. So... Um, I'll come back on the behavioural theory. Um, but you mean... <coughs> but sorry. Um, sort of theories like pr protection motivation. Th you mean looking at motivation, cognitive issues, uh, self-efficacy and so on. Fascinating. Um, we haven't. That didn't. That didn't build into our, our thinking on this. Um, I, I would be fascinated to, to hear how you do it because I think it, I think that's it's it's very interesting. Um, I guess it's. I think it would have taken us too far in terms of. Yeah, in terms of indi individual, cognitive type abilities, in this. But what we were trying to do, but. But that's not in any way a criticism of what you don't, you're doing. I'd, I'd be very interested to, to, to hear more about that. Sounds like you two should be having a conversation at some point. That's good. OK. I, I guess I should answer, um, as it's my boss who's asking, <laughs> uh, what next? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, there, we, uh, there's a strategy to try and roll it out. I think, I think um, this obviously is a huge help uh, by being able to um, disseminate the information about it, and we're very grateful to Alnap for helping us in that. Um, and we, we we have presented in a couple of conferences, and we'll uh, continue to do so. I mean, it would be fantastic if 
we got the DC on board because obviously that would really um, push it out there. Um, so I'm going to be um, sending chocolates to Annie on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. um, but no, I mean, I, I, uh, of course it would be good if we could get more people interested. Um, and I realise they are the meth uh, methodologies. Um, uh, we, we acknowledge the work done by Tufts and also 3IE, so of course it's not, as Roger said before, it's not the only methodology. Um, but we just, um, yeah, we, w we would like more people to use it to, um, to find out whether it really is what we think it is um, and whether, it's, whether it is a, a good way of measuring recovery. So. Perhaps I, I'd like to say something on, on Peter's question. I think I mean I'm I'm the first person to acknowledge the importance of impact evaluation. Um, I think uh, the reason we did we decided to focus on contribution to change is uh, it's because of the partnership we had. We had a specific request of, of working uh, with an NGO saying we want to 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 I mean to develop a guide and a tool that we can use uh, basically that people on the ground can use. And as, as Roger was saying, it doesn't mean that it can use by anyone. It has to be someone with uh, some research skills. Uh, but we wanted it to, to be something simpler. So I think, as, as you said, I think what we what we came up is with something that we think is a complement and something that can be used maybe at a broader scale than, than an impact evaluation. I wonder if any of you have a, a, a view on, on cost because, um, I, I mean, Peter's talking <coughs> about uh, 3IE and doing uh, the, the uh, impact assessments, uh, looking at attribution. Um, is is this more expensive? A lot more expensive than this this kind of approach, or is or, or what, what, have you any idea about the the value for money element of this? I mean, my, I I can say something from I'm coming from a consultancy background, right? I mean, I do think this is cheaper just because the idea is this can be used directly by people in NGOs. So I think what we devised at the beginning our discussions, and I think there is a chapter on the guide in which we talk about the team. You would need people on the ground who will be like people from the NGO who can go and, and use the tool, and you will need people like leading the process with analytical skills. But you are not going to need like necessarily economists working on impact evaluation as such. So in that sense, I think intuitively, without having looked at the numbers, mm. my my gut feeling is is a yes. Mm. Mm. And, and I think we also see it as being that if uh, agencies come together, so it's not just done by one agency because. Uh, the, the idea is to look at the holistic uh, change that's happened and then, it, then uh, from that work out where your contribution has been. So obviously something like with the DEC, it would be a good idea for all the agencies to, to, to contribute to, to an evaluation and then from there be able to see what, um, you know, what, what change has happened and then you could look at your part to, uh, uh, to play in it, which, I, which I, I really do believe is, is less important because it's, it's it doesn't really matter in a way who who helped bring about that change. The fact that it, the change actually happened, I think, is the important thing. And I'd I'd like to see us moving towards that and stop trying to prove that you know we 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 did it by ourselves. Because I think it, I, I I just don't think it's terribly useful anymore. Let's take uh, a last round of questions. I think, Adam, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Vanessa, I'm a student at uh, uh, LSE studying development studies and I have a question about the, um, the reporting and the findings between T plus one and T plus two. If uh, the contribution to change is the only thing that you're actually analyzing and if uh, the person trying to do these reportings and findings, uh, do, do they have a guide to focus on maybe something that was counter the goal that maybe didn't bring about the change that the people wanted and it was more towards the organization and how to address those uh, faults that aren't intentional. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir, in the back row, in the back. Hi. Sorry, this is uh, John Lakeman from Care UK. Oh, hello. <laughs> I didn't recognise you. <laughs> Another, another used to work for Alnap, you, lo you look different. <laughs> <laughs> it's the haircut. Um, so, yeah, I was wondering, um, okay, so the methodology is good for um, showing the contribution that responses make to change. Um, it's less useful for 
um, showing the particular interventions and whether they um, actually made a contribution to the change. But is there is there anything we can say maybe from the experiences from the pilots about um, whether the evaluation produced findings that would help refine and uh, improve the performance of the interventions? Okay. Was that clear? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. <coughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks, John. Anybody else? Peter again, yeah, go, go ahead. Um, you mentioned, I don't know who, I think Marcella mentioned that um, it's uh, not useful or maybe or uh, less usable for situations where there is dis uh, where people are displaced. Uh, I don't know who said that. Um, if we talk about the Philippines, um, large numbers of people have been displaced, uh, either temporarily or, or uh, you know, for good. Um, and in most humanitarian situations, people are displacing themselves as part of their uh, survival strategies or are being displaced as part of the humanitarian onset, uh, uh, onset of the situation. So how do you work with that concept of displacement and how is there a way to compensate for that? Anyone bursting to say anything? <laughs> okay, well, we'll take... Does anything come through remotely? Uh, I'm afraid uh, from the chat room there is, there is a deafening silence in the chat room. So, no. <laughs> 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 so, uh, so, there's a questionnaire about how to deal with displacement, one about whether the research um, uh, you, you found from the research anything that would help you uh, s make some recommendations about how to improve the performance of the intervention and then a question, a methodological question from Vanessa about T1 and T2. Um, I'm sorry, could you clarify the one um, about the T1, T2? I didn't, I didn't quite understand. Um, you spoke about uh, the reporting in yeah. T1 and T2. And uh, I was just wondering if it was only focused on actual contribution to change and if uh, you would advise to also focus and try to see if there were any counter goals uh, that happened, uh, things that you would want to benefit the people there, but it actually ended up being the other way around or maybe didn't benefit them the way that they wanted and how to yeah, assess sure. that. Okay. Sort of yeah, I mean, <coughs> I did. I, I made some reference to it in the in the in the mm -hmm. in the nature of the data that you co you collect and the, and the questions that we ask, and particularly in the qualitative again in the qualitative work, we need to capture that that precisely that aspect, not just to see interventions as as necessarily positive, but that they may have unintended consequences. Um, so yes, that's in order to get this holistic picture of change, we 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 need to look at that as well. Okay. Um, we didn't. I, did, I don't. I don't can you remember of any evidence in the uh, pilots of that coming up? But yeah, as you, as you point out, it's clearly it's clearly likely. So so yeah, it's it's very important to keep open to that. Um, on the displacements question, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, we thought I thought quite a bit about this and actually ended up with a an annex here working with displaced people. So basically, I, there are. And, and if this is crudely simplistic, apologies, but see it in really sort of three, three different categories of, of disaster displacement, two of which we think we could work with. The one we don't think we can work with is, is the very long-term displaced, where interventions are effectively taking place within a displacement camp. Recovery is taking place ex situ, and so you, you, you kind of have a situation and you, you could compare. Um, that's where we've that's where we couldn't see an easy way of adapting this. Though, though I, the more I talk about, think about it, I actually possibly could, but it would, you'd have to. Adapt the tools. Yeah, what you can't do is look at things effectively, e looking at recovery from the from the previous state because because everything has changed for people. Um, so there are some basic underlying concepts that would have to change. 
we can certainly do a situation of short-term di displacement. And the idea of this T plus one is that for small-scale disasters where people may be temporarily dis displaced but can come back, no problem. If there's a, there's a longer-term displacement of, let's say, more than four weeks, but, but of, of the kind of two or three months type of, type of um, time span, and people are returning and are being enabled and assisted to return and rebuild their lives pretty much as, as were. Yes, you can do it. Again, it, it would require some modification in the timings of the actual, uh, of where you take to do, to do this work. And if, and if ideally what you would do is have yet another T, you'd have a T plus four, and you would do a um, some analysis at the point when they r return, which can capture what it was like before, immediate impacts, their livelihood situation on return, and then and then another analysis down the line, um, recognizing, of course, that this you know the reality is often longer term displacement, um, but also, of course, in di different there's different different communities in, in in a disaster are displaced for different periods of time, so so you have the two you know the the different characteristics of displacement happening simultaneously in the same disaster for different population groups. I'm going to. Stop there. There's another, no, the other question that my mm -hmm. colleagues deal with. That was. I mean, I, I think uh, the question about um, um, whether the 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 guide is useful for a particular intervention, and I think th there was a two-part question: a uh, particular inter intervention, and then the refining and or improvement. Right? Did I get you right? For the agency. Um. I, I mean, my feeling is that, I mean, it's not the main goal of the tool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but I guess, it's, uh, I mean, it, it depends. I mean, you can, of course, include questions when, when you define, like, the, quali I mean, the qualitative and the quantitative instruments. You could include questions to assess that. But I don't think it's the main goal of the tool as such. That's my, I don't know if my colleagues disagree, yeah? But, uh, I mean, I, mean I, do I do think that you, you there will be learning. Because, for example, in our pilot in, in Sri Lanka, um, people had been given support to build their houses and actually the money wasn't enough. So most of the houses in the village were, had, were up, up to window level and, and they couldn't complete them. Um, and the same with the cash grants. If, remind me if it's, it's wrong. But like the, the cash grants that they'd been given were, were maybe enough for their immediate needs, but for things like uh, they pawn their gold, their gold jewellery every every year, and then they get it back when the harvest comes in and they haven't been able to. So, I mean, you know, obviously learning like that is you have to give more cash if you really want people to recover. So, so I, th I think I think that would be the the obvious analysis <coughs> at the end was like, okay, so why 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 didn't people recover? And it, was it because it was just so enormous, like in Haiti, that it's just overwhelming, or is it simply that we're 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 not we're not doing enough? And I I suspect it's the latter that we we have these short six term uh, six month programs, uh, put a lot of money into it, but we actually don't look uh, well. I mean, I'm talking Fox Fan, but yeah, maybe in uh, in a lot of cases we don't look at the longer term recovery, um, and and I think that's that's where the learning can come in to what should we be doing in order to 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 re to really help people recover on their livelihoods. Tanya, do you want to say? I think just to add to that, that I mean, <coughs> this doesn't re replace the other kinds of monitoring and evaluation mm -hmm. that um, NGOs need to use if they're going to sort of try to demonstrate their accountability and improve their effectiveness. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, and it's to be used in conjunction or uh, com complement, complementary way rather than to replace you know, the other forms of evaluation. Any final thoughts from the floor? Annie, please. Thank you. Just a final question. Mm. Um, if, if sort of six or nine to 12 months would be uh, a good time um, for an initial um, use of the contribution to change, given that the Philippines is likely, well, for the DC, it's going to be a three-year response and it's likely going to be a long-term recovery, would it be appropriate then to, to, re to, to do this a second time further down the line? towards the end of that three-year period to really have a look mm. and see. Oh, and maybe we'll learn something then about the length of time it takes um, mm. after a major destruction. Mm. Brilliant. 
And the lady in the grey cardigan just behind there. Sarah Hughes, Independent. Um, a thought leading to a question, and it's not unrelated actually to what other people <laughs> have been thinking. Mm. It occurs to me that this could, could be a very useful method uh, for cyclical type disasters, um, flooding situations or um, cyclone situations or the sort of smaller scale disasters that affect communities quite regularly and that it would be very interesting to be able to chart um, sort of longitudinally changes in the relative balances between um, the contribution and what was required or what was needed. Um, you're all nodding. Could you say a little <laughs> bit more, obviously? <laughs> um, what sort of thoughts did you have about that? That's great. That's a leading question. Does anyone want to have the final word, or should we have, should we l leave the final word with with that question, which is a which is an interesting one? Okay, we'll leave it there, Sarah. You had the you had the final word there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I see it's me. Um, yeah. So in terms of the uh, the three year program in the Philippines, for sure. I mean, you. Let, let's assume that one does a retrospective several months from now. Primarily because it may be just extremely difficult to to go in and do this type of work now, and possibly inappropriate. But you know, that's a, a debate. Um, certainly, one couldn't leave it any longer than than the twelve months we've suggested. But but then, yeah, I mean, doing one, doing another similar type of study with with yeah basically with the same same communities two years on would be highly illustrative I mean we haven't sort of su suggested that because we're, we're kind of assuming that in many cases the, the finances just won't be there but if this if it's the DEC doing it um, and pooling resources then yes yes I definitely um, on the cyclical yeah we well actually we discussed we came right up against of course recurrent hazards as as actually you do almost anywhere you go um, it's it's uh, it's probably I, I would say probably rare to encounter a situation where a, a community is is not or not still in the process of recovering from a, a previous hazard particularly if they're in a hazard prone area um, so we thought about it mainly in terms of that as a caveat really of having to take that into account so when one's looking at and trying to understand recovery processes you need to understand the pattern of previous hazards and that they superimpose on one another, as does as does the response. Um, in terms of actually studying cyclical uh, events, or rather, sorry, evaluating, I should say, studying, mm -hmm. revealing my, my background mm -hmm. there. But mm -hmm. um, yes, I, I think one could. Um, recognizing though that it that it will, you're unlikely to be able to isolate the effects of one from the other so that's so you're mm. you, you're basically trying to analyze a situation of recurrency if you see what I mean rather than rather than sort of like so I think tracking the patterns to individual events will be would be difficult not necessarily it obviously depends on the context and how frequently they are they do take place it's an interesting question and and uh, despite all our nods we don't have a <laughs> adequate <laughs> answer I'm afraid well at least I don't mm -hmm. No, I think I just found it a very interesting question. That's, that's the reason why I was nodding up, but I, I think that I, I don't have much to add to. I think both the last questions were very enriching, so it was a good way to close, I think. All right. Uh, I have two uh, short uh, announcements, just to let you know that uh, there is a two-minute video uh, which introduces this book, and it's available on various websites, the Practical Action Publishing website, Oxfam Policy and Practice, and the ECB ECB Project website. Is it's, that, is on, right? it's on Elnab now, isn't it? Uh, and it's on Elnab. Okay, yeah. is it? <laughs> well, the ECB has they moved down there? Oh no, no, not yet, no, not no, yet. Okay, We're okay, in the okay. process. Okay, okay. <laughs> so you can watch that two-minute video uh, uh, at, at your leisure. And also, just to say that there will be a French and a Spanish version of this coming out in January, which is excellent.
Listen, everybody, thank you very much for uh, your thoughts, ideas, questions. And I would particularly like to thank uh, Roger, Danny, Marcella, and Vivian for their uh, great presentations and, 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 and also for writing this guide, which is going to be a, a valuable tool. It's not the answer to everything, as you say, but it's, a, it's another tool in the, in the toolkit, and it's going to be of great use and value, I'm sure, hopefully, in the Philippines. So if you join me with just giving the panel a round of applause and we'll call it a day. Thank you.